We're going to do things a little different today, a little bit. Good to see each and every one of you here. We're a little skinny, so I'm trusting that the, the, those that are not here are enjoying the extra day on holiday and seeing family and friends, and so that's always good to encourage them to do that, too. Uh, we're going to start different. I, I, we did this a few months ago, I think. It might have been even back in July. Uh, but we're going to start with the National Anthem. Okay? I, I'm going to sing it, so I don't know if y'all want to stand or sit. Whatever. <laughs> I never know what to do and stuff like this, because I don't want you to just stand there. All right, there you go. See, always have help. Let's stand for that. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the Stay standing if you would. Hymn number 424. this morning. So.
find your way and grab a seat at your pew. Oh, it's good to see you. <laughs> It's so good to be here this morning with all of you and to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, if you are visiting here with us, we want to have a record of your visit. If you would just tear off this in your bulletin and place it in the offering plate. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, there are quite a few announcements, but most of which you need to pay attention to is about VBS. Um, and we are excited about that. I cannot believe that this upcoming Saturday is our block party. Um, and that is June 4th, this upcoming Saturday. Uh, from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. And if you have, haven't planned on coming to that or if your calendar was full, go ahead and clear your calendar and come to it anyway um, because it's going to be a good time um, and we're going to have a bounce house and lots of games and uh, free food and, and there will be people from this church there to promote VBS as well as be able just to pray for people that come by. Um, so invite your friends and um, even those that aren't your friends, go ahead and invite them um, because we're so excited about that. And that's a kickoff to our VBS, which is June 6th through the 10th. Uh, it's a Monday through Friday, and that's going to be in the morning. At 8.30, they can come for a free breakfast provided by the Open Door Ministries, but then VBS will begin at 9 and go till noon. So we're excited about that um, and thankful that we have almost all the parts needed in order for VBS to work, um, and so we're, we're looking so forward to that. Um, we also need, however, um, cookies of any kind, whether that be homemade or bought. Um, and if you could bring those to the church anytime this week for Pat, um, we want to be able to provide the kids with plenty of sweets. That way they can be nice and calm for their teachers uh, during Bible study. Um, but again, invite your friends to that. That's anywhere from babies through sixth grade. And Pastor Don will be teaching an adult class through the book of Hebrews as well. Um, so look forward to that if you aren't doing anything. You'll notice Pastor Don is not here this morning because he's in South Carolina celebrating his mother's 90th birthday. Um, and so be in prayer for him this morning. Uh, would you pray with me? God, I thank you for who you are. You are so good. You have spoke the world into existence, all of creation. You are all powerful, yet you care for us. I'm thankful for that this morning. Lord, I'm also thankful for this building that we have to gather and we can worship your name loud. Lord, and around the country and around the world, there are places where um, that is not possible, where Christians are persecuted simply for saying your name. And I thank you this morning especially for those that have served um, in our military, Lord, that have made um, our worship here possible this morning. So Lord, I pray that we don't take that for granted, but that we would worship you this morning out of the joyfulness in our hearts, that we would worship in spirit and in truth. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Not generally one for commercials, but uh, we have something that's kind of going on in our, our city. Uh, most of you know my daughter, Gabby, she dances at Studio A with a... Uh, uh, Anna Crumley, I can't think of what her new name is, she's married now. They are doing a patriotic <laughs> spring recital. And they had an opening day last night for it. They had a concert last night and they had one today at 2.30 at the Hecker. And uh, they have been teaming up this past year. They went, all the, all the kids went down to the veterans home and kind of adopted a veteran. And they've been corresponding with them, talking with them and everything. And they were bringing all of them in, putting them on the front row, and the whole show, it's about an hour and a half, you got a little bit of a 10 minute break in the middle, um, and the whole show is all about Veterans Day, about the service, everything is patriotic all the way up, so if you if you have a patriotic go button, it will definitely get hit. And uh, there's one one thing, I, I think they want a little bit of a spoiler, there's a thing that, I, if you remember Ronald Reagan's speech at Arlington, and uh, they do it. Uh, the kids do a dance there and they have the, the flags and they have it at, at a half mass and they have the dance while Ronald Reagan's speech is being read and it's I'm telling you now you can't go by me because I cry toilet paper commercials <laughs> but they I, I, I cried the whole way through and then to make a great evening top off I'll put on the dad hat for a second my daughter won dancer of the year so it was really a great thing but she's dancing today she's uh thank you she is going, uh, she has her solo today, and the veteran that she adopted, they interviewed. And so it's really been a 
a good thing for her because she's been asking all kinds of questions about because she's 14 and a lot of 14 year olds don't know a whole lot about well anything and uh, I have my own opinion about 14 and 17 year old girls but I get in trouble because I, I almost sold all three of my older ones when they were 14 on eBay but uh, they do straighten out those of you with 14 year olds they get better but uh, anyway I wanted to buy I think the tickets are twelve dollars something like that if you don't have a ticket you want to get there about 20 minutes early it's all reserved seats so you don't have to fight for your seat or anything like that but it's really a, a good show Anna is a, a good Christian lady and it's always evident in what she does uh, they do an amazing grace there that's just absolutely gorgeous but uh, I, if there was a church in town that would appreciate this you all would right. anyway commercials done let's continue I'll let you remain seated fire instead he keeps me singing 
Taylor as he's getting ready to preach, Lord, that um, the words that he speaks would um, just be completely about you, and um, Lord, that you would provide him um, just boldness in, in what you have taught him. And Lord, I just pray that you would touch our hearts today and help us to learn more about how to follow you um, in our everyday lives and that our lives look more and more like Jesus every day. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Our offertory hymn number 15, Come Thou Found. Let's all stand, please. <laughs> service. Um, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we're able to gather and worship, worship you and praise you and give you all the glory. And we ask that please you bless the United States of America and our um, elected officials that they make decisions that are in your will. We ask that you bless and protect the men and women that are serving in our military. We ask that um, as we have a vocational Bible study coming up, that it will be a great success. We, um, we I ask that you um, bless Brother Taylor today as he's going to deliver the message. We ask that um, anybody here that hasn't found Lord Jesus as their Savior, that this would be the day. We ask that as we collect this offering, that um, you bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
you are good and you have given us your word. I thank you for the book of Romans where we will be today. That we can learn more about who you are and about how we should respond. I pray now that you would give me words to speak, though I am a sinner, that I would boldly proclaim Christ and Him crucified. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. Many of you already know that uh, this morning we'll begin a short series uh, that I have titled The Lies We Believe About God. Uh, and I will continue that series throughout the uh, Sunday evenings in June, other than Father's Day. And this partly comes from a book written by Tim Chester, entitled You Can Change. And I've not actually read the book, but I'm familiar with four statements that Tim Chester uh, uses within his book that have been taught to me. And the one that we're going to look at this morning is God is good, so I don't need to go elsewhere. God is good, so I don't need to go elsewhere. So I'm excited to um, show you how I have found that to be true through the book of Romans and through my learning of Romans. And so we are going to be in Romans chapter 8, if you would turn your Bibles there. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 31 is where we'll begin. In the book of Romans, Paul is speaking to uh, the early Roman church, and, and in Romans, he's laying out the gospel message, salvation history. And we pick up in Romans chapter 8, right in the middle of that salvation history. Um, and so, if you are there, if you would just give me a hearty amen. Amen. All right. Romans chapter 8. Verses 31. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also, along with Him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is He that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. You may remember uh, the last message that I preached at Calvary. Uh, we were going through uh, a passage in Philippians chapter 2. And in Philippians chapter 2, uh, Paul is writing and he asks a number of questions but I explained it this way, that he's not really asking questions. He's not unsure. He's not doubting what he's asking. He's rather confident. And I explained it this way. It was on a Sunday evening that uh, when I lived at home, my dad would sometimes ask me to do something, and he would say, Taylor, will you take out the trash? And because sometimes I feel a little bit ornery, I would respond with, no, I won't. And I can still remember every time my dad would, would say, let me rephrase that. Go take out the trash. You see, my dad was never actually asking me a question, even though the sentence had a question mark on it. He was sure that he wanted me to take out the trash, whether I felt like doing it or not. And that's similar to what Paul does uh, in our passage uh, this morning in Romans chapter 8. And so read with me again just that first verse, 31. What then shall we say in response to this, the gospel message he's laid out, if God is for us, who can be against us? And I want to let you know this morning that Paul was not doubting whether or not God was for us Christians. That Paul was sure, and it can be read this way, if God is for us, and He surely is, then who can be against us? But I want to draw attention to one thing um, that's important, and that is context. We may immediately think, when we, when we read who can be against us, we may want to um, jump out of our seats and say, well, no one, no one can be against us. And all, although that's true, I want to make sure we're aware of the context. Look with me at uh, verse 8, 18 in that same chapter of Romans, 8, 18. I consider that our present, what do your Bibles say? Sufferings, our present sufferings. So Paul says in the same chapter, um, both that the Christians are facing sufferings, which comes from 
enemies, from adversaries, from persecution. He says that they're facing sufferings as well as who can be against us. And I want us to be careful because if we think that who can be against us means that we won't have enemies, then we're, we're mistaken. Because Paul and uh, those Christians in the early Roman church surely had enemies that they had to face. And so what does Paul mean and how can he say both who can be against us and our present sufferings? Well, let's finish that verse 818. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul explains that yes, although uh, suffering will, ex will exist and persist in this broken world, that those whom God is for, those sufferings and those persecutions and those enemies make not a little bit of difference in God's eternal plan for us. And what, what this means is that they cannot take our assurance of heaven that is given to us through the Spirit. They cannot affect our eternal destination through um, their persistent um, annoyance of persecution. That we know that because of the blood of Christ, that those persecutions don't even make an inch of difference in God's eternal plan for us. This is why Paul is able to proclaim uh, boldly, who can be against us, those whom God is for. Not that there won't be enemies, not that there won't be uh, sufferings in a broken world, but that those enemies do not make a difference in God's eternal plan for us. And then the next verse in, in 32, 832, one of my favorite verses, Paul says this, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? I wonder this morning how many uh, parents we have in the sanctuary, if you would raise your hand. If you are a parent. Most of you, most of you are parents, and, and I, I want to share a story with you that I think will resonate, especially with, with um, parents this morning. And it was an article that I read in um, Fox News that was written by Joshua Rogers. And he was a writer in Washington, D.C. And he was also a worship leader in his church. And Joshua, in this article, explains that as he um, led practice once a week, the band members would be on the stage and he would be there. And I'm not sure what he played or sang, but, but he led the worship. And um, his children, he had a few daughters, his daughters would play in the sanctuary or up in the balcony of the church. And so while the band was playing, his daughters were there um, up in the balcony of the church. And, and Joshua in this article explains that one day as they were playing over the loud music, he could hear a scream, a loud scream. And he looked up, and there he saw one of his daughter's fingers caught in the balcony door. And he did what any of you might do, and he dropped whatever he was holding, and he jumped off of the stage, and he sprinted back. Uh, to the back of the sanctuary, and there were stairs up to the balcony that had a chain across, and he said that he lunged over it, almost falling, and he took the stairs three at a time, and he flung open the door that caught his daughter's fingers, and as she screamed and cried, he picked her up and just said, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. And many of you can relate to that. that you may have been through a very similar situation, and, and you do, would do what Joshua did and would drop everything in order to rescue your child, right? Well, the story doesn't end there. Joshua goes on to write that as he got things figured out and he went back to the stage, the drummer asked if he could pray for Joshua. And Joshua said, of course. And, and the drummer began to pray and he said this, God, I know it must have broken your heart to see your son in pain there on that cross. Yet for our sake, you did not rescue him. Those words have resonated with me this week. Yet for our sake, you did not rescue him. Church, the love of the Father is so great. It is unimaginable that he would not only allow, but he planned for his only son to put on flesh, to be spit on, to be beat and lashed and die a humiliating death on a cross. That the Father planned for this to happen for our sake. For our sake. And that's an incredible thing to think about. And just like Joshua, who wanted to rescue his child and, and would do anything to do so, uh, the Father in Heaven, who spoke the world in, into existence, could have spoken one word, and it all would have stopped. He could have spoken 
one word and, and the persecution against Christ would have ended. Yet for our sake, He did not rescue His Son. And that is amazing, amazing love. And so Paul begins to argue uh, in verse 32, He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us, how will He not also along with Him graciously give us all things? You see what Paul does here? He compares two different things. One being, if God has enough love for us that He would send His Son to die on a cross, surely He loves us enough to provide for anything else that we may need. The argument here is that um, if God would do the impossible, sparing His own Son, if He would do the impossible for us, surely He would do these reasonable things such as providing for our needs. And I want to return to that soon, but let's continue with Paul's words uh, in verse 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is He that condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So Paul asks two questions again, of which he's not um, trying to communicate doubt, but he's trying to build his argument. And, and what he's doing is saying, not that anybody won't be against Christians, not that people won't bring charges against Christians, but what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross made possible our justification before God. That we are made right before God. And this affects what happens here on earth. Namely, that those who bring charges against Christians don't have the last word. And if we are accepted by the God who created the universe because of what Jesus has done, then surely it does not matter whether or not we are accepted by those around us. Not that it's not okay to seek friendship and seek approval, but, if, but we are searching for um, acceptance that we already have from God, then there's no need for acceptance from man. And so Paul is trying to explain that um, we are justified before God through the interceding work of Christ, that there's no one who can truly bring a charge against us. There's no one who can truly condemn, and this is not by our own works church, that our attendance here does not make us right before God, that our good deeds don't make us right before God, but only the shed blood of Christ makes us right before God. And we should never shy away from speaking of that shed blood of Christ. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more than... Will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? See, Christ's work on the cross has given us the opportunity to be made alive. And those who are made alive in Christ are justified because of Christ before God. And for that reason, there is no uh, condemnation that can be brought against us by man. Paul then continues in reminding us of the great love of Christ that makes that possible in verses 35 through 37, if you'll read those again with me. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. If anyone can write these words, it's Paul. For he did face uh, persecution, he did face hardships and trouble and nakedness and danger, and he would die because of his faith. But how is it that he's able to say that we are more than conquerors, and we too, brothers and sisters, can be more than conquerors? How is that? Well, I'll give you three reasons. What has happened, what is happening now, and what will happen. What has happened is this, that Jesus Christ did not stay dead, but He rose again. Amen. That He already conquered. And so us conquering is not a guessing game. We don't have to wake up in the morning and think, man, I wonder if I'll conquer over what I face today. Because Jesus Christ has already conquered on the cross, that our Savior didn't just die, but He rose again. 
And not only that, but uh, Romans 8.11 tells us this, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. So what has happened is that Jesus has already conquered. And what is happening now is that the same Spirit that helped that conquering, that made that conquering possible, that rose Jesus from the, from the grave, is in us. Also allowing us to conquer through Christ. But not only what has happened, not only what is happening now, but we know that this broken world will not have the last word. That Jesus will come again. And we know that, um, that He will come to renew this broken world and that those who are in Christ will reign with Him. And even if that's not soon, we know that we have an eternal home without brokenness, without persecution, without danger, without sword, without famine or nakedness. And so we know that although this broken world may throw these things at us, we are more than conquerors through Christ, who died on the cross and rose again, through the Spirit who lives in us now, and through our eternal home that's provided through Christ. Are you tracking with me that we can be more than conquerors just like Paul because we have the same Christ as Paul? And that's a significant thing to think about. And that's only possible through Christ's love, which again, Paul expands upon in verses 38 and 39. For I am convinced, Paul says, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Did you see how Paul began to name specifics? Angels, demons, present, future, uh, powers, height or depth. And then I wonder if, this, if Paul began to think this is going to take a long time if I name out all the things that can't separate us from Christ's love. I wonder if he was writing, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he begins to write out these specifics, and he said, why don't I just write all of creation? That all of creation, that nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. <clears throat> and this is a good reminder that I'll speak, out, uh, speak about more in just a moment, but our love that Christ has uh, put on us, that Christ's love is not dependent on what we do today or tomorrow. That His love is not separated um, by our works, by our performance before God. And we know this because of the cross. Because when we were at our worst, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's an amazing love. That's not performance. If Christ were to only love us based on performance, we would not be loved very much at all. But Christ, while we were at our worst, died for us on that cross. Amen. And that's how we're able to know that um, Christ truly does love us. That there is no separation from His love for those that are in Christ. And that's why I love that Paul ditches the specifics, although they're important, and he just says, all of creation, none of it, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is so loving towards us. And God is good. And I wonder if you believe that this morning. And I, I, I wonder if you believe that not only in your head, but if that then reflects and translates into our actions. And there's a distinction. Let me explain it this way. Emily and I, as we've been working on our house, have bought a number of things that need to be assembled. And that is a big pain. We bought a grill that probably you could cook a million meals on that thing in the time it took for us to get that thing assembled. And we bought a closet organizer and on the box, and we picked it out, and, um, and it was just this wonderful closet organizer. The people's clothes looked so nice on it. Well, we had some help over that day, and Haley, one of our youth, was there, and Ernie was there, and, and Emily, myself, and Ernie were in that closet looking at these instructions and just scratching our heads and looking at the closet and looking at the parts and had no idea what was going on. In fact, the instructions probably could have just been thrown away because that didn't help too much. But Haley's advice was this. She was standing a little bit over to the side, and she had the box with her. And she was looking at the box and the nice uh, picture of the closet organizer, and then she was looking at us, looking at the instructions, scratching our heads. And she said this, 
well, why don't you just look at the picture and build it? <laughs> and I looked again, I said, what? She said, just look at the picture and then build it. And many of you know, if you've done this before, if you've had to assemble these things, you know that the picture looks good, and you want it to look like that, but when you have all the pieces in front of you, it's a little bit of a different story. And I want to tell you this morning that the Scriptures can, can have the same effect, that we can look at God's Word, and we can say what amazing love God has for us. We can say God is so loving. We can say God is good, yet when we enter into our lives, and we try to put the pieces together and live that out, man, that's a different story. There's one thing, knowing that God is love, and there's another thing, um, acting out with our lives and demonstrating that we truly believe that truth. And oftentimes, we believe the lie that our actions demonstrate that we believe the lie that God is not good, that He's not enough. Whether or not we believe that in our heads, whether or not we were able to say that, um, whether or not we've read it in the Scriptures, that oftentimes our actions demonstrate that we believe the lie that God is not good. That he's not enough. And so I want to uh, show you a couple of ways in which we show that through our actions. And one of those ways is, is through our seeking of approval. Through our seeking of approval. That I can see in our schools and in our workplaces, and when I'm just out in the town, and especially on social media, we are an um, approval-based society. That we care deeply, deeply about how others view us, what others think of us. That oftentimes we determine our own worth by um, how people respond to us. We determine our own worth sometimes by how people like us or how they view us. And I'm worried that that has infiltrated the church as well. That sometimes we can be so caught up in how others think of us that we forget what God thinks of us. And sometimes in our churches, um, we may act a different way than we do elsewhere because we want to live up to what we think others may approve of. Are you tracking with me that sometimes we may wear a certain thing or say something or, or do some action that seeks the approval of others? Not that those actions are always wrong, but oftentimes... It reflects that we believe the lie that our God's approval is not good. That it's not good enough. But when we read Romans chapter 8, we can see that because of the interceding work of Christ, that we are approved by God. That we are made right, we are justified by God, which means we don't have to go elsewhere for approval. That all of our approval that we need is met through the interceding Christ. Amen. Not through each other. And I'll tell you one more thing that I'm worried about as far as seeking approval goes within the church is that we are too worried about being approved to, commit, to confess sin. That that's an important part of our fellowship together is confessing sin so that we may grow into mature believers. But I'm worried that oftentimes we care too much about how others see us. That we don't want to mention our sin. And that's a dangerous thing is a church that doesn't bring up sin because of how we might be viewed. But I know that I'm a sinner, and I know that we are sinners, and that confessing sin is important, and it must be important that we don't have to seek each other's approval because we are approved by God, which means that we may confess sin to one another. And that if one of our members or uh, a member of another church or another believer responds in a negative way and, and perhaps condemns us, we know from Romans 8 that there is no condemnation from others if we are in Christ. So there's nothing to fear. And I worry that um, our seeking of approval has had a negative effect on our confessing sin. Another way that we demonstrate with our lives that um, perhaps God is not good, that He's not good enough, is through our stress. It's through our stress. And I know this from experience. Oftentimes, I will go through a time, a really stressful period, and then I'll look back and I'll say, man, God did provide for my needs. Why couldn't I have thought of that just a week before? 
And how does this happen? How does stress demonstrate that we don't believe that God is good enough? Because what have we seen through Romans chapter 8? That God spared His own Son for us out of His inseparable love. And that's a powerful combination. A God who is sovereign and a God who loves us unimaginably. Those are two powerful things when put together should give us absolutely zero reason to have stress. Whether that be at work, whether that be at school, whether that be um, just among our friends or at home, whether it be the political situation that's happening now or, or money or whatever it is, we know that we have a God that is sovereign who loves us unimaginably. And though things may happen around us that um, indicate the world's brokenness, that we must have no fear, that we can have um, no control of the situation, but God does. Because what Christ has done on the cross has made possible our stress reliever. That yes, we may be worried about um, money or where things are going to come from. We, we may be worried about how work is going, but we cannot worry, we cannot stress to the point where we think we have to figure things out. Because we are not sovereign. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me to think, man, I've really got to figure this out. When I have a God that loves me unimaginably and who is sovereign, who knows all things and who works out all things. And so my prayer for Calvary Baptist Church is not that we would read the scriptures and we would be able to know truth such as God is good. And He's good enough. Such as God is love. Not that that Calvary would be able to do that in addition with our lives reflecting the truth that we hear and we speak. Are you tracking with me that I pray for Calvary that we would not only believe the Scriptures in our head, but others will look at us and know we believe the Scriptures because of our lives. And a way that we can reflect that one way is, is through understanding that we have the approval of God and not seeking others' group. And one way that we can reflect that in my prayer for Calvary is that somebody would look at us, that they'd look at Robbie, that they'd look at Ward or Pat, and they'd say, man, they're not stressed out by anything. What is that? And that they'd stand up and they'd boldly say, well, I'll tell you, I've got a God that loves me more than you could ever imagine. And I know that He's in control. And that's how we can, with our lives, demonstrate that we believe that God is good. Not just in our heads, not just looking at the picture of God's Word, but actually putting the pieces together in our lives. Romans 8 is, is one of my favorite passages to read, and it's a big stress reliever for me, and it has been, even as I've stressed over this sermon, that I've had to remind myself, Taylor, you've got to preach to yourself, too. That you have a God that's sovereign who, who will surely provide for your needs if He put Jesus on a cross. Surely He will provide for your needs. And I've had to remind myself, because even though I can speak the truth and understand the truth from the Scriptures, it's a lot more difficult to live the truth. And so that's my prayer for Calvary. That we would read God's Word, that we would read Romans 8, we would understand and believe not only in our heads, but through our lives, that our God is good. That He loves us unimaginably. That if He would spare His own, not spare His own Son, if He would give His Son up to crucifying, being crucified on a cross, then surely He will provide for our needs. And if that is true, then that will make a difference in our lives. It has to. If we believe that, that won't stay in our heads. That will be lived out. It will go from our heads to our hands and to our lives. And that all stems from God's amazing love for us. And His love for us is the uh, biggest part where we can see the Gospel. That while we were sinners and weren't right with God, we couldn't find our own way to be right with God. And it was impossible that Jesus Christ came to earth. That God Himself put on flesh and He died for us. But He didn't just die, He rose again. 
that by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, we too may share in His life. And that's only possible through the love of God and that He has shown at the cross. So I want to invite you this morning not only to believe that God is good, that God's love for us is great, that the Gospel is true, but I want to invite you this morning to leave this place and live as though you believe those things. Not just you, myself as well, that we need to be a body of believers that lives out the truth of God's Word. And that is my prayer for you all this morning. And I hope that as you leave, that you will read the Scriptures and you'll start proclaiming something, or maybe you'll teach um, and you'll think to yourself, man, I need to believe this first. I may be saying it, but I don't know if I'm living. That we'd catch ourselves in the act. And we would see the Scriptures and begin to live like the Scriptures. Because our God is good. Our God is enough, and we don't have to look elsewhere for our approval, for our satisfaction, for love, because it is provided in the person of Christ. Will you pray for me? Oh God, you are good, gracious, glorious, and great. Your love for us is so strong, so amazing, and I'm thankful this morning that it's not based on what we do, because we are sinners. But I thank you that you sent Christ to die for us. Even while we were at our worst, that you loved us and Christ died for us. Lord, that we have the opportunity to place faith in you and through that have life. God, I pray for anyone here um, who does not know that love, that they would seek it out in the scriptures and throughout this congregation. That they would ask questions. Um, whether that be to me or Pastor Don or, or any of the members of this church, that they would come and they would say, what in the world does this mean? Does God really love me this much? Lord, I pray for those that um, do know God's love, that understand God's love through the Scriptures. And I pray that they would not only understand it, but that they would live it out. God, you are good. It's in your name.